Hi, welcome to my channel, Obs and Kind Made Easy. Today we'll be discussing preeclampsia. In the next chapter, we'll talk about eclampsia. Before we talk about preeclampsia, let's look at a few basic definitions. Hypertension. Hypertension is a blood pressure of systolic more than 140 and diastolic more than 90, measured two times at least six hours apart. Chronic hypertension is non-hypertension before pregnancy or hypertension diagnosed the first time before 20 weeks of pregnancy. Pregnancy-induced hypertension is a hypertension that develops as a result of the gravid state. It includes gestational hypertension, preeclampsia, and eclampsia. Gestational hypertension is a blood pressure of more than 140 over 90 for the first time in pregnancy after 20 weeks without proteinuria. Preeclampsia is gestational hypertension with proteinuria. Eclampsia is preeclampsia complicated with grand male seizures and or coma. Superimposed so preeclampsia or eclampsia. This is occurrence of new onset of proteinuria in chronic hypertension. Preeclampsia is a multisystem disorder of a non etiology characterized by a hypertension of systolic more than 140 and diastolic more than 90 with proteinuria after 20 weeks gestational age in a previously normal tensive and non proteinuric woman. However, some of the preeclamptic features may even appear before 20 weeks gestation age. This is seen in cases of a molar pregnancy and acute polyhydraminose. Now, to make a diagnosis of proteinuria, you can use a dipstick protein, a 24-hour urine collection specimen, and the albumin to creatinine ratio or protein to creatinine ratio. These are some of the ways you can test for protein urine. The albumin creatinine ratio and the protein creatinine ratio are more specific and sensitive than the dipstick and 24-hour urine specimen. So in cases where you're not sure about the protein urine, let's say a patient also has a UTI, because in a UTI, if you do a dipstick protein, you can have a protein of one plus or even trace, okay. So in a cases where you're not sure about your dipstick protein, you can use the albumin creatinine and the protein creatinine ratio to confirm the it's diagnosis. Your genesis. Etiology is not clear, but it is thought that abnormal placentation is the initial event that leads to endothelial cell dysfunction and intense vasospasm, affecting almost all the blood vessels, especially those of the uterus, the kidney, the placenta bed, and the brain. Now, if you look at this diagram I've put down here, these are the trophoblastic changes that occur in pregnancy, okay? In a normal pregnancy, in preeclampsia, this is the non-pregnant state. Okay, now if you look at the non-pregnant state, these are the spiral arteries. These are the, these are the acute vessels. They branch off from the uterine artery. Now, in the non-pregnant state, the vessels have low capacitance, high resistance, and they are narrow bow. Okay, now I'm going to jump into the normal pregnancy so that you know what happens in the normal pregnancy before we go into preeclampsia. This is the acute artery. These are vessels that branch off from the uterine artery. This is the spiral artery. This is the artery that, spe that feeds the placenta. And this is the myometrium. And this is the decidual myometrial junction. The decidual is the mucosal lining of the, of the uterus. It's also known as the endometrium. And these are the trophoblast. This is the placental bed. The trophoblasts are specialized cells of the placenta that help the developing embryo attach to the wall of the uterus. So what happens in normal pregnancy is that there's endovascular trophoblast invasion into the spiral arteries. Now this occurs in two waves. The first wave occurs between 10 to 12 weeks of pregnancy and the second wave occurs between 16 to 18 weeks of pregnancy. The endovascular trophoblast invasion occurs in the in the walls of the spiral arteries. Now, in the first wave, this endovascular trophoblast invasion occurs only in the deciduous segment. The second wave occurs where the trophoblast invades the spiral artery walls in the myometrial segment. This occurs between 16 to 18 weeks. This endovascular trophoblast invasion of the spiral arteries replaces the endothelial lining and the muscular arterial walls by fibrinoid formation. The spiral arteries then become distended and funnel shaped. So these physiological changes that occur during trophoblast invasion transforms the spiral arteries into low resistance, high capacitance, and wide bore vessels. 
So this results into a high flow system, which results in adequate blood supply perfusion to the placenta bed. So what happens in preeclampsia is the ease of endovascular trophoblast invasion of the spiral arterial walls in the first to 10 weeks, also known as the first wave. This only occurs up to the deciduous segment. However, the second wave that should occur in the myometrial segment does not occur. So there's no trophoblast invasion of the spiral arteries in the myometrial segment. Remember, this occurs between 16 to 18 weeks. So what do these blood vessels do? What do these spiral arteries do? They retain some of their pre-pregnancy characteristics. That is of being low capacitance, high resistance, and they are narrow bow. Okay, so this results into a low flow system, which results in impaired perfusion to the fetal placenta unit. To put in words what I just illustrated above, abnormal placentation occurs in preeclampsia. So what happens is there's complete or partial failure of trophoblast invasion of the myometrial segments of the spiral arteries. Hence, spiral arteries retain some of the pre-pregnancy characteristics, being relatively narrow bore and low capacitance and high resistance, resulting in impaired perfusion of the fetal placenta yes. immune intolerance. So what happens is the spiral arteries reject trophoblastic invasion. Basically, the body cannot. However, normal placentation that occurs in normal pregnancy the trophoblast cells invade the spiral arteries within the first 12 weeks of pregnancy and replaces the smooth muscle of the vessel wall, the spiral arteries, converting them to white ball, low resistance, large capacitance vessels. This completes by 20 weeks gestation age. Let's look at some of the factors that contribute to the development of preeclampsia. In normal pregnancy, angiotensin II, a vasoconstrictor, is destroyed by an enzyme called angiotensinase that is produced by the placenta. This results in stabilization of the blood pressure. And also, the vascular system becomes resistant selectively to angiotensin II, a vasoconstrictor. This is brought about by vascular synthesis of nitric, o nitric oxide and prostaglandin I2. These two are vasodilators that oppose the effect of angiotensin to a vasoconstrictor. However, in preeclampsia, there's relative or absolute deficiency of prostaglandin to a vasodilator and increased synthesis of thromboxin, a potent vasoconstrictor produced by the platelets. There's increased vascular sensitivity to angiotensin to a vasoconstrictor. This is because there's reduced activity of angiotensinase. There's deficiency of nitric oxide, a vasodilator. And there's also increased synthesis of endothelin. Endothelin is a more potent vasoconstrictor than angiotensin II. There's also production of inflammatory mediators like tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin-6, and others. These are derived from activated leukocytes, which cause endothelial cell injury. There's abnormal lipid metabolism, which results in more oxidative stress. This is brought about by the production of lipid peroxide, and oxygen reactive species which result in injury on the endothelial cell integrity this is why we say preeclampsia is characterized by endothelial dysfunction and vasospasm endothelial dysfunction is due to oxidative stress and the inflammatory mediators whilst vasospasm results from the imbalance of vasodilators like prostaglandin and nitric oxide and vasoconstrictors like angiotensin II, thromboxane and endothelin Risk factors, prime gravidas, this is their first pregnancy. It is more common in prime gravidas. This is because this is their first time exposure to the trophoblast. So what happens is that uh, in the normal fetal maternal transfusions that occurs during pregnancy and especially during delivery, it exposes the mother to products of the fetal genome. These products are in the next pregnancy. So the prime gravidas have not yet been exposed to the trophoblast. This suggests immune intolerance. This also occurs in new paternity. This is because the protective effect of the first pregnancy seems to be lost if a woman has a child with a new partner. More risk factors, extreme of age, multiparous with preeclampsia in previous pregnancy, multiparous with 10 years or more since last baby, pre-existing hypertension, like chronic hypertension, polycystic ovarian disease, family history of hypertension and preeclampsia, and obesity, a BMI of more than 35, 
Placenta abnormalities like in molar pregnancy, twin pregnancy, polyhydraminous, and diabetes. It results in underperfusion of the placenta. This is because there's ex excessive exposure to the trophoblast. Pathophysiology, there's premature aging of the placenta. You can actually see areas of infarction on the maternal side of the placenta. This is because there's impaired blood uh, perfusion to the placenta. There's a characteristic lesion called glomerular endotheliosis. This is when endothelial cells swell up and fibrin-like deposits occur in the basement membrane. There's also impaired renal blood flow to the kidney. There's impaired glomerular filtration. There's impaired tubular reabsorption. And there's selective loss of albumin and transferrin. Now remember, albumin maintains the so What happens is this is your blood vessel. There's vasospasm and there's oxidative stress to the inner lining of the endothelial cells. So there's loss of integrity of the endothelial lining, which results in permeability. So what happens is the, plus, the platelets are going to come here to try and patch up this. So an inflammation starts occurring here. And then fibrin comes to try and patch up this. So what results is a thrombus formation, obstructing the lumen reducing blood supply to the organs. And then because there's vascular permeability, there's impaired glomerular filtration. So that's how you end up with a protein. There's intense vasospasm of the blood vessels. So the circulation in the vasa vasorum is impaired, leading to damage of the vascular walls, including the endothelial integrity. In the liver, there's periportal hemorrhagic necrosis due to thrombosis of the arteries. Remember the inflammation I talked about, platelets, fibrin deposition. It results into a thrombus formation. A subcapsular hematoma can also form. The failure of fibrin deposition results into a parenchymal necrosis of, of the liver, which is associated with increased liver enzyme. When there's an increased liver enzyme, it essentially means there's some damage to the liver. This is also associated with HELP syndrome. HELP syndrome is H for hemolysis, EL for elevated liver enzymes, and oh, low platelets, platelets occur because there's consumption of platelets in the blood vessels at different sites. It's not just one blood vessel. This is occurring in many sites, the kidney, the liver, the retina, the brain. So what happens is because of the loss of integrity of the endothelial cells, there's damage to the endothelial lining. So platelets come to patch up this at different sites in the brain, kidney, liver. So there is systemic consumption of platelets. That's why we end up with a low platelet count. There's vasospasm of the blood vessels of the brain, which result into capillary thrombosis, infection, intraventricular and parenchymal hemorrhages which results into cerebral edema. There's also vasospasm of the retinal blood vessels. In cardiovascular and respiratory system, you remember I said in preeclampsia that vessels show hypersensitivity to angiotensin II, a vasoconstrictor, and other vasopressors like endothelin and uh, thrombopsin, which are potent vasoconstrictors. So this increase peripheral. This results in an increased intravascular high pressure and loss of endothelial cell integrity, which results in a greater vascular permeability and contributes to the formation of edema. This results in heart failure and pulmonary edema. I'll explain more just now under edema. So how does edema occur? There's increased oxidative stress on the endothelial cell. So what results is an endothelial cell injury, which results in loss of integrity of the endothelial cells. So these capillaries become leaky. Okay. There's increased capillary permeability. So this is the intravascular system. So there's loss of plasma. Plasma starts coming out of this intravascular system into the interstitial cells. Once plasma comes out of this intravascular system, there's reduced oncotic pressure in, in the intravascular system. So the body now starts retaining sodium and water to bring back the intravascular pressure to normal. And once this occurs, the intravascular pressure is brought back to normal or might even become high. The pressures might even become high. Fluid again starts moving out into the interstitium. This results in edema. Proteinuria can also result into edema. How does this occur? There is spasm of the afferent glomerular arteries, 
So what does this do? It squeezes this blood vessel shut and results in two hypoxic injury to this tuft. The tuft is just a branch of vessels that form part of the basement membrane. So once there's hypoxic injury to this, there's inflammation, there's platelet aggregation, fibrin deposition. So the endothelial cells start swelling up now. So this characteristic lesion is what we call glomerular endotheliosis. Now, due to loss of integrity of these endothelial cells here, of the basement membrane, there is increased capillary permeability. So we have a proteinuria. There's leakage of protein. Now, remember I said albumin is one of the proteins lost in urine. And albumin is important in maintaining the oncotic pressure. So once you lose albumin in your urine, the oncotic pressure reduces in the intravascular system. Okay, now the body now starts retaining sodium and water to maintain this intravascular pressure. Now once there is sodium and water retention, the intravascular pressure increases so high, there is now movement of fluid into the intestine, which results into edema. Classification of preeclampsia. So there's mild preeclampsia and severe preeclampsia. Mild preeclampsia is characterized by blood pressure of systolic more than 140 and diastolic of more than 90, but systolic of less than 60 and diastolic of less than 120 without significant proteinuria. The proteinuria should be at least 0.3 grams in a 24-hour urine specimen or 1 to 2 placenta dipstick examination. Remember the blood pressure should be measured at least 2 times and should be at least 4 to 6 hours apart. Severe preeclampsia. This is persistent blood pressure of systolic more than 160 and diastolic more than 110 with proteinuria. The proteinuria should be at least 5 grams per liter in a 24-hour urine specimen or 3 to 4 placenta dipstick examination. In the absence of proteinuria, it can also be diagnosed if the patient has one or more signs of symptoms of severe preeclampsia. There can be elevated liver enzymes. So when you do your test, you see a high alanine transaminase, raised aspartate transaminase, raised indirect bilirubin, and also raised lactate dehydrogenase. There can also be thrombocytopenia. Thrombocytopenia of a platelet less than 150,000, and they can also be HELP syndrome. Remember, this is hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelet count. It can also be renal dysfunction. So when you do your test, there'll be a raised creatinine or a raised urea. The patient can also present with severe headache or altered mental status. This is usually because of the cerebral edema. Visual disturbances like scotomata, dimness, or total blindness is usually because of retinal detachment. Pulmonary edema is because of overwhelming edema, so the patient can present with dyspnea. Severe epigastric tenderness is usually because there's hemo hemorrhagic gastritis. Liver tenderness is because there's stretching of the subcapsule. Remember the subcapsular hematoma. Oliguria of less than 80 mL per hour is usually because of renal dysfunction. Intrauterine growth retardation means there's placental insufficiency, meaning the, fit, the fetus is not getting enough blood supply. So suppose this pregnancy is about 32 weeks gestation age, and then when you examine the pregnancy, the height of fundus is about 24 weeks gestation age. This is a sign of intrauterine growth retardation. There can also be sudden swelling of the face, hands, and the feet. Now, one feature I probably forgot to mention is that another symptom or sign is left ventricular heart failure. Forming in preeclampsia is when there's severe preeclampsia with exaggerated reflexes. This is a warning sign. All the symptoms will be evident and the patient is about to develop eclampsia. Investigations to be carried out, you can do a urinalysis to look for protein. You can do a full blood count. In the full blood count, you're looking for hemoglobin, red blood cell count, and your platelet count. Hemoglobin and red blood cell count might be low, as seen in cases of hemolysis and HELP syndrome. So there'll be an anemic picture here. Also in HELP syndrome, there's a low platelet count. So it might be low. Platelet count of less than 150,000 is significant. You can also do your kidney function test, which is creatinine and urea.
This might be raised if there's renal dysfunction. You can also do liver function tests, other than transaminase, aspartate transaminase, or bilirubin, lactate dehydrogenase, and albumin. Expect this to be elevated if there's hepatic dysfunction. Albumin will be reduced because you're losing protein in your urine. There's proteinuria. The clotting time will be might be raised or might not be raised, but if it's more than 10 minutes, this is alarming because you might have prolonged bleeding in this patient. You can do an obstetric ultrasound to, to check for estimated fetal weight. Complications of preeclampsia, there's immediate complications and long-term complications. For the immediate complications, you can get eclampsia, you can get retinal detachment. In the lung, you can get a pulmonary edema. In the heart, you can get a left ventricular heart failure. In the kidney, you can get renal failure. And you can get suprarenal gland failure, also known as Addison's disease. And then in the liver, you can get liver cell failure. Hematologically, you can get disseminated intravascular coagulation. In the placenta, you can get accidental hemorrhage, also known as abrupt shock placenta. In the fetus, you can get intrauterine growth restriction, intrauterine fetal demise, and prematurity. You can also get antipartum hemorrhage and postpartum hemorrhage. Long-term complications include residual hypertension. So some of these patients might develop chronic hypertension in the long term or recurring preeclampsia. They might have preeclampsia in their next pregnancies or can have chronic renal disease. Management of hypertension in pregnancy. Some of these complications can be prevented during antenatal care. So educate the patient on the signs and symptoms of severe preeclampsia, the headache, the severe pain just below the ribs, sudden swelling of the hands or feet, problems with vision. You can give antiplatelet agents in high-risk patients. This is low-dose aspirin, about 75 milligrams to 150 milligrams. So you start giving aspirin from 12 weeks gestation age until they give birth. Some high-risk patients include um, hypertensive disease during a previous pregnancy, patients with chronic kidney disease, those with autoimmune disease such as systematic lupus erythematosus or antiphospholipid syndrome, or patients with diabetes, or patients with chronic hypertension. Patients at moderate risk, you can also give low-dose aspirin are those who are having their first pregnancy, more than 40 years old, Pregnancy interval of more than 10 years, uh, body mass index of more than 35, family history of preeclampsia, and those with uh, multi-fetal pregnancy like twins. Triple. Lifestyle changes in high-risk patients like diabetics, chronic hypertensive patients, obese patients. Encourage them on a diet, exercise, and rest. And then also assess proteinuria on each antenatal care visit for this Management patient. Management of chronic hypertension. Lifestyle changes I have already mentioned. You have to switch them from their previous antihypertensive. Most of these patients would have been on SE inhibitors, thiazodiuretics. So now discuss with them that these drugs, SE inhibitors and thiazodiuretics, can cause fetal congenital, congen, fetal congenital anomalies. So you have to switch them to safe antihypertensives in pregnancy like labetalo, nifedipine, or methyldopa. 
Give them low dose aspirin, 75 mg to 150 mg from 12 weeks gestation age until de they deliver. Now, if their BPs are well controlled, they're less than, let's say, 140 over 90. The target blood pressure is 135 over 85. So if their blood pressures are well controlled, it's less than 140 over 90. Deliver this patient at 37 completed weeks. Only deliver early if it's necessary. Means of delivery is induction of labor and cesarean. Induction of labor when there's a good bishop score of let's say more than seven, and cesarean section when there's a bishop score of Remember less to than discontinue methodopa after two days of delivery. Monitor their blood pressures postnatally. Management of gestational hypertension. If their BPs are let's say ranging from 140 to 159 systolic and their stolic ranging from 90 to 100. And uh, these are usually outpatients which you can be seeing in antenatal. You should put them on antihypertensives, labetol or methodipine or methodop. Advise patients to have a BP profile. Tell them to take their BP measurements at home or at the nearest clinic and come with them during the antenatal care visit. Now, during antenatal care, remember this patient should be checked protein and urine. Assess liver function tests, urea and creatinine, and full blood count. If the blood pressure is systolic more than 160 and diastolic more than 110, manage as a severe hypertension. Admit this patient and manage as hypertension as a hypertensive agent. Put this patient on antihypertensive. Most commonly used drug is hydralazine when the diastolic blood pressure is more than 110. So hydralazine is about 5 mg to 10 mg given every 15 to 30 minutes until the diastolic blood pressure is less than 110. Collect urine for proteinuria and collect blood for full blood count, liver function tests, renal function tests to assess any damages in the kidney and the liver and if there's any help syndrome. Discharge only when the BPs are controlled. Gestational hypertension will deliver at 37 completed weeks if the BPs are well controlled. Early delivery is only when the BPs are not well controlled. Induction of labor or cesarean section, depending on the bishop's score. Postnatal BP control, I said you can discontinue methodopa after two days of delivery. Continue monitoring this patient for BP. Management of myopreclampsia, you manage as in gestational hypertension as above. Make sure these patients are coming for antenatal care every week until they are of severe preeclampsia. Admit to the special observation unit. Involve your senior. Put the patient on antihypertensives, labetol or methodopa or nephedipine. If the diastolic blood pressure is more than 110, put the patient on hydralazine until the diastolic blood pressure reduces to less than 110. Start this patient on magnesium sulfate. Remember, magnesium sulfate prevents eclampsia. So you give a loading dose of 4 grams intravenously, 5 grams intramuscular in each buttock, so that's 2. So a loading dose of 14 grams, and then you continue giving magnesium sulfate every four hours for at least 24 hours from the time they deliver. Now, something to look out for is you should monitor this patient for magnesium sulfate toxicity. Signs and symptoms of magnesium sulfate toxicity include urine output of less than 30 mils in an hour, respiratory rate of less than 16, and absent knee jerk reflexes. When this occurs, this means there's magnesium sulfate toxicity. Give an antidote, which is calcium gluconate. Collect blood for a full blood count, liver function test, renal function test to assess if there's any hepatic or renal dysfunction or any help syndrome. You can also do a bedside clotting time. Restrict fluid intake to about 1.5 to 2 liters in 24 hours because these patients are already at risk of developing pulmonary edema and left ventricular heart rate. So if pulmonary edema has already set in, give the patient prosomite. Treatment is termination of pregnancy. 
Deliver immediately if the pregnancy is more than 35 weeks or is 35 weeks gestation age. However, if it's less than 35 weeks gestation age, you need to give steroids. Steroids used are dexamethasone and betamethasone. Dexamethasone is 6 milligrams two times a day, maximum of four doses. And betamethasone is 12 milligrams two times a day, maximum of two doses. Okay, so you deliver within 24 hours after the second dose of giving steroids. Remember that fetal lung maturity is complete by 34 weeks gestation age, okay? So in patients who are less than 35 weeks gestation age, we're supposing that fetal lung maturity has not yet completed. That is why we give steroids to help with fetal lung maturity, okay? Now the benefits of giving steroids in pregnancy are one, in the fetus, it improves fetal lung maturity, it reduces the risk of intraventricular hemorrhage, it also reduces the risk of ne uh, neck necrotizing enterocolitis. In the mother, it improves the platelet count and also improves the urine. The benefit of giving betamethasone is that you can only give two doses and then deliver the patient. Whilst dexamethasone, you have to give four doses, okay? But then betamethasone is expensive. Methods of delivery are induction of labor if the bishop's score is good, cesarean section if there's a poor bishop's score. Active management of first stage of labor is with oxytocin because we do not use egometrin. Egometrin is contraindicated in hypertension in pregnancy, cardiac disease in, cardiac disease in pregnant, and also postnatal BP control because these patients are not these patients are not out of danger of eclampsia. Now, something I wanted to mention on the signs and symptoms of severe preeclampsia. Okay, here. Oliguria is not 80 mils per hour, so less than 400 mils in 24 hours. Discussion on preeclampsia. The next chapter is going to be on eclampsia with I, kids introvert. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel for more videos, okay?